All right, you were there looking at Mount Hood, I think probably over the Bull Run Reservoir. And we're going to talk about Portland's water tonight. We have a guest, Scott Fernandez, who's with Citizens for Portland's Water. He's been on the program a few times in the past. And as I've said many times, you know, in, on this program, there's a billion people on this planet that uh, don't have adequate water. And it's like you were just saying, water is something we take for granted around here. And uh, there are some things in play right now that might make it so we won't take it for granted. One of which would be the r rising rates. And so we're going to talk a little bit with Scott about the situation here the, with the, the status of Portland's water and there's moves being made to cover up our uh, reservoirs needlessly according to Scott and according to a lot of other folks and uh, we'll just move on through open up the phones in a little while and uh, hopefully folks will want to have some questions and some comments about this because uh, water is a pretty important thing people will be killing over water like they're now killing and going to war for oil in the near future if they aren't already so who knows you know what we get on the news ain't necessarily what's really going on and and there may be things going on in some countries that might there might be some water rights that are somewhere involved in it and maybe we'll uh, find out about that when we have phone calls tonight viewers out there I found on this program are very well informed and hopefully we'll so throw some things at you you didn't know and uh, kind of round out your knowledge a little bit so welcome to the program Scott well thank you for having me um, I appreciate this opportunity to review what was what's going on with our drinking water system as we saw that in that first picture that's a uh, picture of Mount Hood and the the origin of our drinking water which is the Bull Run Lake right there and it is uh, a great gift that the uh, pe previous uh, people of Portland have given to us it is unique in that it's federally protected which is the only one in the United States so there is no human entry um, and that it makes for very cu good pure water and very healthy water because there's no sewage exposure from uh, cities or or agriculture or industry and that gives us a big leg up in, in water purity and water quality and and allows us to have a minimal treatment which we'll see as we go through the program is really good for our public health. Now okay. you mentioned minimal treatment. I was actually I did a summer with the Forest Service in early early 1970s, and they were logging, and we were stacking brush and doing brush fires and all that. And I sent I, I know that since then uh, Frank Gerhard and some folks organized and stopped the logging in that area. That's right. And so what they do with all those roads? Well, that's a good question. Uh, Frank Gerhard and a, a gentleman named Dr. Joe Miller were instrumental in stopping that. And Doug Larson also who is a, a very good advocate for the uh, for the bull run system. What has happened over the years, uh, Jim, is that they have begun decommissioning those roads because they don't need them anymore and that's good because then they'll go back to a natural habitat that adds for additional um, filtration, so to speak, a natural filtration of all the debris before it gets to the water is filtered out through the natural soils and, and forest uh, products that are up there. And so this is very good and we see that that's happening and, and adding a, a great, great deal of water quality because the, the dirt from the roads that, was eroding, that were eroding uh, ended up as sediment in the drinking water which it doesn't happen very much anymore. So it's been a good deal to have that logging stopped because we just don't need to have that. Is the, did the water get better after that? Yes, it did. And we have had uh, fewer turbidity events. Turbidity is just kind of the where the soil uh, clouds up the water, and we've had fewer of those turbidity events over the years thanks to the stopping of the logging. Well, that was kind of a, a little bit of a diversion, but it's important for folks to realize that we do have the most pristine water. I, I imagine there might be some in the world that are as good but uh, probably none that are better and uh, the filtration system is really really important and and uh, what's kind of lead us right directly into what what we want to talk about here at least first off is is the the moves to uh, cover the reservoirs and and the situation that's going on with the city council in, in order to under supposedly under mandate of the EPA to 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 cover up the reservoirs when there's no no really they're not really finding gypsospiridium and some of these other things that are supposedly in the water right and so I know you ha you have a lot to talk about on that well over the last decade we've been many of us as uh, citizens have been fighting the EPA with this regulation it's called the long term two enhanced surface water treatment rule and it would uh, force us to add um, 
drinking water treatment in the at the Bull Run watershed that we don't need either filtration or ultraviolet uh, radiation. That's uh, that's nationwide, right? And this just happens to be our local one. Okay, right. And we're fighting it because it's a one size fits all regulation. They treat our they equate our water to. Um, water that the in the Mississippi they which is it goes through sewage exposure in the Mississippi and has all kind of agricultural exposures and they they say that that water quality is is allegedly the same as ours it's very that, turbid too and very turbid it has all kinds of chemicals in it from fertilizers and pesticides that ours doesn't have and so we've been fighting that because it would add cost to our drinking water bills which are already high it's gone. Our water bills have gone up over 55 percent over the last few years, and and will go up in double digits over the next five and, and and more years. So it's very expensive, and that's just in the planning part of it. So we're trying to continue to stop it, and EPA has now handed it over to the state of Oregon to oversee the process, and we are in a process now to uh, have the state of Oregon say that we don't need it because we have not found any contaminants that are problematic and in our uh, drinking water system up at the Bull Run that we see right there. And also we're, we're fighting to keep our reservoirs open and we'll go through that, um, some diagrams that we'll see later in the show that show the benefits of open reservoirs versus the covered reservoirs that have been, um, have neg very strong negative effects of, of water quality. The open reservoirs have excellent water quality, the covered reservoirs do not. So we'll look at that later on as we go through the program. You know, I have one question. Uh, did this uh, mandate from the EPA come out under the Bush administration and then uh, the present administration is following suit or is this all from, uh, from Obama administration? It started uh, back in the Clinton era in, oh, in really? the mid-90s mid and kind of wound, it didn't go very far until uh, until the Bush administration in 2003 they put out the draft rule and then in 2006 they adopted the full regulation and that's really when things uh, got got enthusiastic on our part because it was a regulation that we didn't need to have and we we the city of Portland said many times in the community uh, meetings and stuff that we don't want this regulation we don't need it because we don't have a public health problem within our system so does, is the uh, is the Obama administration made any any overtures or any commentary to, to, to designate why they've continued this? Well, uh, yes, yes they have. And one of the things that we've been been pushing is for our city council to get more engaged in asking for a waiver. Um, what has happened though, is, and thankfully so, is that in the summer of uh, 2011, just six, seven months ago, the senator from New York, uh, Chuck Schumer, went to the EPA and said, hey, we don't need to cover our reservoirs either because we don't have a public health problem. And, they, and the EPA listened to Senator Schumer and said, you know, you're right, we're going to review this again, we'll review the whole regulation, and we will depend on the science. And so that has evolved over the last few months, and, and we are asking um, right now for the state of Oregon to extend our open reservoirs and they did uh, city council passed the resolution a couple weeks ago that will support that adding a few years for us to keep our open reservoirs and hopefully the state will go along that along with that it isn't done it is not a done deal yet and and so we're keeping our fingers crossed well see i wasn't aware of that 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 they had well, I don't know if I should say they backed up or what, but they were wanting to move ahead with it. But now they have at least put things in, in uh, suspension for a while then, basically. Right, and thankfully Chuck Schumer uh, put that, in, that uh, into play and there was really very little choice for the, for the city not, of Portland not to do that because our reservoirs are actually more contained and, and safer. Uh, there's no freeways going by our, our reservoirs like there are in, in uh, New York, so that keeps people out of there. Um, our reservoirs have been very good for all, over 100 years. There's never been a public health problem ever, and so this is very good for us to keep these reservoirs open at this time, and it saves us money. Well, you may cover this in a little bit, but I'm wondering now uh, why the big scare over gypsum spiridium, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, if, if, uh, if there's really no danger of it. Well, it all started in, in the early 90s when Milwaukee, Wisconsin had a uh, catastrophic sewage event. And uh, the problem with cryptosporidium is always linked to, to sewage. And this has been one of the things that we've argued. This is an organism, not a, not a chemical. Right. 
and it is a parasite and in sewage you have many many different nasty organisms in there, nasty bugs and so for them to identify only cryptosporidium as the organism that caused all the problems that they had uh, was not it's not scientifically supported and that's one of the things we've argued that the regulation and the methods that used were not scientifically supported and none of the things that they said were going to be a public health problem that EPA said none of those things have come true and that's another reason why we argue against it none of them came true in Wisconsin right and the same thing from around the United States uh, they have just not had public health problems from drinking water from surface drinking water um, around the United States like EPA said that we would it's just not happened. Understand. Well, I think that's a pretty good introduction to what we're gonna to the PowerPoint you've got going here. So we might uh, move on into this here. Okay. We'll go through a couple of these first slides kind of quickly because we've already p talked about it. That's just my background, but we're um, this talks a little bit about the sewage exposures and and it's the chemicals that come through the treatment process and that are retained in the. Uh, covered reservoirs that are our problems, not the microorganisms, and that's why we've been fighting it. What, what chemicals? The chemicals that they're putting in the water, you mean? This diagram shows in, in our, in, to answer your question, yes. Sure. Um, this shows our bull run as, as only using chlorine and ammonia as a disinfectant. If they get their way, or if they wanted to get their way, UV, ultraviolet, and ozone, and filtration would be used as a uh, treatment pro um, process that we don't need. And you can see on the screen that formaldehyde, aldehyde, acrylamide, and, and these are all toxic and carcinogenic chemicals, um, would be added to it, which is, it doesn't make any sense to us to do that because through the treatment process that they use. And then if we uh, went further and looked at the Willamette River and the Columbia River that has been over the years has been proposed to be blended with our bull run water and we strongly oppose that that you get all other all these other types of chemicals PCBs and nuclears and hormones and pesticides and so we want to keep our bull run water without added treatment and we don't want to have uh, we don't want to have it blended with the Columbia River or the Willamette River so what you're saying is they're wanting to take a pristine water source and blend it with a, a, a polluted water source that's and, then, and then and then and uh, then have us use that as our drinking water. That's right. That's what the corporate engineers want to do. And these are some of the um, chemicals that also come along with with the uh, covered reservoirs and with the treatment. We can see specifically that and we don't need to get into the details of each chemical there, but cancer can be caused by um, a nitrogen-based chemical and chloroform and radon that we get from the Columbia South Shore well field that would not be able to vent in a covered reservoir. Um, this is not good. And then we see, can see birth defects from these chemicals that they would be uh, exposed to with added treatment and covering the reservoirs. And these chemicals can also get into breast milk uh, which is not good for kids. And so we've uh, applied to um, Berkeley and he had put through a, a breastfeeding promotion act and we wanted to let him know that these chemicals are there and so he is aware of that now and has been very helpful in moving this uh, EPA thing along in our favor. How is uh, the other senator standing on this? They've um, I don't want to get into politics, but they've been quiet and, and publicly. They may be working behind the scenes, but um, Senator Merkley has really taken the lead in that. But we do appreciate the efforts that uh, Senator Wyden and uh, um, Congressman Blumenauer have put forth. Um, anyway, on this is the chemicals that we are concerned with also have more of an effect on, on children, too, than, than anybody. Um, and the EPA has 80, 80 chemicals that, that are only regulated and 80,000 that they are aware of. So there are a lot of chemicals that are in the environment that, that uh, are not regulated in uh, drinking water. Are these 80,000 are chemicals that are found in human bodies? They can be, yes, yeah. They're out there, they're being exposed in, well, in everyday products and pesticides and, and herbicides and things that we consume in, in our uh, in everyday life. Um, but we don't want to add these to the to the drinking water we have, and that's that's our our purpose for for talking about it because we can't control everything in the environment, and we know that we understand that. But we don't want to add this stuff to our drinking water for a problem that doesn't exist. 
Well, there was a news anchor a while back that went on to his show, and I forget who it was, and uh, he went and had tested, and they found an incredible number of, of uh, chemicals in his blood. And uh, he wasn't making a case for anything in particular. He just made that statement that if anybody out there, and the, the viewers were to go have their blood tested, they wouldn't find 80,000 chemicals, but they would find a, a large amount of them. That's exactly right. And there, I remember that study, and there was another one done up in Washington where they found things like fire retardant. And the chemicals that they were finding in their blood have, have come through, through contaminated drinking water. And that's why we don't want to drink Willamette or Columbia River drinking water, because we know that those chemicals are present there, we know that they're not present in our bull run. Those, those chemicals of uh, fire retardants and, and hormones and other things like that. Mm -hmm. And that's what they were finding. Antibiotics from the, from the farms. Exactly. And that's what we don't want. We just don't need that. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. And this is what I was referring to earlier. This is where natural soils in, in our area, in the red part there, you see is the radon. And that's what we don't want to have uh, coming into our drinking water in covered reservoirs. That's naturally occurring radioactivity. Exactly. It's naturally occurring, and it comes up from when we use the Columbia South Shore well fields. Uh, we use those periodically during the summer. And as the, uh, if we covered our reservoirs, like at Washington Park and, and Mount Tabor, there would be no place for that radon gas to escape, and it would end up in our homes and businesses and schools. So we want to keep that reservoir all those reservoirs open I think I just recently saw on TV where they shut down the Bull Run watershed our water from from them for three days because of some flooding and uh, I think that was just recently here and uh, they were using these well fields that's exactly right and that happened uh, just a few weeks ago um, because they got we had a dry fall for the most part and then we got a big surge of rain that came in and that that kind of clouded up the water and when it gets to a, a certain point EPA says you have to use an alternative source you just can't use cloudy water so that's what they were doing and that will happen periodically uh, and that's why we don't want to uh, cover the reservoirs because when we do use it uh, it does bring radon but it vents naturally into the atmosphere without the uh, without the covers in it mm -hmm. and that's great well, natural processes are always the best, it seems like, if they're adequate. Exactly. And Mother Nature, we, we found that Mother Nature is much smarter than us. And this is a, a diagram of, of, the, uh, of the open reservoir and how the sunlight acts as a natural disinfectant also. So that's a big benefit to us. Because it's a, it's, it's a, it's a chem... Well, I forget the word. I remember from school. It, uh, it's a, it's a chemical... It creates a chemical reaction, the sun does, on the water. Exactly. Exactly, and it, it causes one of the benefits of the open reservoirs too is oxygen, and everybody knows about peroxide uh, as being a uh, antimicrobial agent when we, when we get a cut or something like that, hydrogen peroxide, and that's one of the chemicals that transitions through the process with the sun and acts as a natural disinfectant for the open reservoirs. You're exactly right. But if it's not an open reservoir, then, then the sun won't react upon it that way. Exactly, and you have a whole... It's a whole different uh, deal with uh, a covered reservoir, and there have been no incidences of people dying in an open reservoir from chemicals or microorganisms, where we have seen several incidences over the years of people dying from uh, methane contamination in their water and, uh, and the covered reservoirs, and also salmonella that have gotten in there through birds that have gotten in through a vent, and people have died from that because they, people didn't know the the utilities didn't know that the birds were in there pooping into the water and um, having that go on for weeks and months at a time. We have recommended to the Water Bureau many, many times to put bird wires over our reservoirs. And I know that's a concern to other people. And it should, you know, they could do that very easily and we've found those to be very effective, but for some reason the Water Bureau hasn't gone along with that. Randy Leonard especially hasn't gone along with that. And just so the public knows that we do test the water every day for, for microbial contamination, and it's really clean. We very rarely get anything that, that, posit that is a positive. So I do want the public to know that we are testing all the time in the city of Portland. Mm -hmm. And this just summarizes what I said before with the deficiencies of the... Uh, of the uh, covered reservoirs. You get gases, you get nitrogen buildup, you get uh, 
petrochemical leaching, because one of the things we'll see at the next slide is that in the new reservoirs that are covered, they put rubberized asphalt as a coating, and that uh, is very, very toxic. There's benzene in it, and as that breaks down, it can work its way into the water. Is that what broke down up in the, the reservoirs in Seattle? That's exactly right. Good. Good memory. This well, is that just really stuck in my mind that they put this stuff on there and it broke down and contaminated their water. Exactly. And that's it. And this is a picture we see right now from uh, a couple years back when they were uh, putting these things in and they had to go back and re-engineer them because they were getting toxins into the water from these, uh, these things. And, and one of the things that we see that's problematic is these are the same engineers that want to design our covered reservoirs and have the contract to do it uh, if we have to force be forced to do it. So, so uh, they already have the people under contract to do it if and when it gets done then. Exactly. They're ready to go if, if the EP says we have to and we will continue to fight them. But yeah, these are the same guys that, that had the problems up there. Mm -hmm. And this is what a, people want to know what a covered reservoir looks like. This is a diagram of one. This is that one in Seattle that was uh, that was so having so many problems, and you can see different lines along there where the cement came together, where it was um, laid out, and those are are, are are seams that can add can provide uh, contamination to occur up on the, so where's, uh, where's, the, the where's the water in that picture it's an empty one they this is right so before this, this would be the reservoir we're looking at it would be filling the space where those columns are exactly okay yeah they would come up just below the surface of the water or just below the surface of the uh, reservoir where the water level would be and that's the um, that's the covered reservoir they're much different than than our open reservoirs you can see that there's no sunlight getting in there So this is the conclusion part. Um, the EPA wants to do the regulation that, that we don't need. Uh, it's going to cost a billion dollars, including debt service, if they force us to do this uh, for a problem that does not exist. And one of the big things that, that we object to is over the years there's been a, a movement from the uh, engineers uh, to privatize and, and start to blend our Willamette River, our Bull Run water with Willamette River water. And that was done through a study in 2000 called the Regional Transmission and Storage Strategy. And that was the, uh, the beginning paper for this thing to take place of privatization. And we still oppose that very strongly. Because we would lose all control of, of uh, public input of, of what our water system was like if it was under private contract. And there are private contract um, utilities in the area right now at Wilsonville, they have privatized water with their Willamette River water intake and also uh, privatized sewage at that spot also and I believe Gresham has privatized sewage also. Well there's a move worldwide <coughs> towards privatization. I think there was even a city here in, the, uh, in this country that uh, privatized some of its uh, utilities. I think water might have been the one. Is, is that correct? Are you familiar with that? That is correct. Uh, there have been uh, attempts uh, throughout the uh, years to get um, cities to privatize their water and we see, we've seen that a couple times in California that, that, that there was really it turned out to be a bad situation for the utilities. We've also seen it happen in, in Indianapolis which is a city similar in size to ours where several years ago they turned it over to a company called, I think it was called Veolia, and it is, an out, it is, I believe, out of France. And over time there was a huge buyer's remorse because the water quality and the water utility, just customer service, all that stuff, and costs went up and customer service went down, so they bought back the contract for almost $30 million from the the corporate privatization uh, group and uh, now they have their own water utility back under uh, public oversight and they're very happy for that and so I think that's a lesson for all of us to learn and to keep in mind that privatization while it may sound good initially on paper um, it's not and it has not shown itself to be good in the United States maybe somewhere else but I haven't heard of any good outcomes for it Everything I've ever heard has been bad. Yeah. Whether it's been other countries, I think Bolivia, they end up having to, they they ended up somehow some company got a hold of the water rights and water got so expensive people couldn't afford it, and they had to boot them out, 
And I understand that now that's before the, uh, the WTO to make a decision. Of course, th of course, the the country got sued because because they uh, they uh, na nationalized it. <coughs> And uh, I'm pretty sure it was Bolivia, and it uh, uh, it just seems to me that the privatization is a p word to me. I mean, it, it 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 may have its its place, but I don't think that along with health care and some of the other things that that are should be a natural right for people, uh, water is a is a natural right, and it and it, it should not be a, a up for profit. Well, that's it, that's it exactly, and we see that, that when they come in and privatize, they will essentially fire all the current people that are, are working there and hire people at a, at a lower wage, at a lower wage that does cause rage, but it, uh, it doesn't provide the, the oversight that the regular workers had put and, and the, the ability to understand exactly what's going on as, as they have oh, having many, many years of experience. Um, and also what, what concerns us is that chemicals that can be used in the water treatment process um, may be the cheapest ones and, and where they're being sourced, outsourced, we don't know. We do know that, that chemicals that have come from overseas, so there was an example in Boulder not, rec not too long ago, or recently it was, where they got uh, chemicals that had been contaminated with arsenic and lead. And so these things come up and it was just by a chance that they tested for that and, and these things happen, and we just don't want that to see, don't want to see that happening here. And one more thing that, that really comes into the question is that there's been discussion around City Hall about fluoridation of our water. I was just going to bring that up. <laughs> good, good. good timing. <laughs> and uh, sure, if you want to talk about that. Well, I mean, just that I, it crossed my mind that you were mentioning about contaminants. I mean, flor the, the, fl the fluoride they want to use, it comes from a very, very marginal, not very good source. And I don't remember what that source is, so hopefully, you know, you can speak to that. Well, thank you. And yes, it, there are several sources: um, uh, the aluminum industry and the that fertilizer was it. industry. That was it. Yeah. And I've read some places where even it's the uh, you know chemicals uh, that are not used in the nuclear industry. So these things are all all waste products from each one of those industries and they there's there's no oversight about the contamination in there and and there is fluoride with contained within it but they're very toxic uh, chemicals and uh, fluoride is is just a small part of the chemical process that's being used what concerns me also is that fluoride is very very ne has a very negative effect on salmon and uh, they have a very hard time in fluoridated water since and and we've seen that before with the aluminum plant up near, I think it's the Dalles, where they had very bad problems with, with salmon spawning going uh, up the river because of the aluminum uh, outfall and the fluoride outfall from all that uh, aluminum processing. Mm -hmm. Well, the point I was thinking, and, and, and of course you addressed it, is, is uh, when the folks are down there in Salem trying to get fluoride mandated to put in our water, they don't tell us where this fluoride comes from or what's in it. That's exactly right. And so it, it it goes through a process where the EPA uh, turns it over to a, what they call the NSF, the National Sanitation Foundation, and they do the checks, but that's just, it's, it's periodically. They'll do batch sampling of, of the products that come through, and they don't test everything that comes through at all by any means, and so it's, it's kind of a hit and miss type deal. So you get uh, approved products that come through, they could come from overseas, and we just don't know what's in it, and we just don't need to feed that put it into our drinking water uh, for a problem, again, that does not exist. Mm -hmm. Well, you've, you've covered this quite a bit. Is there, is there any more there? The, being the conclusions, I guess this might be all there is to it. And uh, there's just so many things that stick in my mind. This whole thing of not allowing the water to breathe and natural processes, I think, would, would uh, how do they address that? They, meaning the folks that uh, not so much the EPA, they're making the mandates, but uh, the, the folks that, that are accepting this and thinking that, yes, we do need to cover these, oh, I don't know, well, maybe the engineers or whatever, how are they responding to the fact that they're creating an artificial condition that, that uh, could possibly make things worse? 
Well, that's a very good point because what we've seen over the years that, uh, and I'm glad you brought that up because that's one thing that we identified very early on in this process is that the engineers, the corporate engineers, were the ones that developed this regulation. They're the ones that, it, that uh, initiated the public process um, and they're the ones that administer it from EPA. And what we did find is that uh, the corporate engineer who was the boss of the one of the corporate engineers in this area, this other guy was uh, from Southern California, but he was the chairman of the EPA Science Drinking Water Committee that oversaw the development of the um, LT2 EPA regulation. So there was a distinct conflict of interest at that time and, and still remains. This is this regulation is not based on science. We've shown that, that their methods are unreliable, they're uh, arbitrary, they're inconsistent, and they just have no scientific basis to it. It is, to be blunt, it's been scientific fraud that we've identified because none of the things that they said would come true have come true. And that's very problematic. And it's mainly money-based. That's the thing that we see the most. We, we are very concerned that our Water Bureau capital projects are 40% are debt now. And that's very, very alarming because that puts us in a very bad position that we have to borrow more money and it just kind of creates a, a, a bad process for it. And that's why we see the continued double digits of the uh, water increasing in price because they're paying off these bonds. My water just went up. I was surprised how much it's went up. And I think you told me the other day it's going to go up again in July. And that's before they're even having to borrow money to do this? That's exactly right. And it'll go up 11% at this time that they're projecting the budget to go. And, and their projections for the few years out after that are, are still more double digits. So this will continue to be the problem that we see. And, and, and you're exactly right. We haven't started building a, a plant. They've designed, they spent over $20 million designing a plant that we don't need, wasted money, and uh, we haven't uh, done anything to, to build this ultraviolet radiation plant that we still don't need, um, but when that happens, we'll be borrowing more money. So this is all a very big problem, and it just doesn't need to happen. And when people are on fixed incomes, and, and that's, that's a lot of people in my neighborhood are people on fixed incomes, and they are very concerned about this because they're their checks that are coming in from from various places are not going up and they have to put all this together to uh, increase uh, utilities uh, along with the other costs of living that are going up. This is this creates a very hardship for the community. You know I have a, a issues with you know cable of course how it keeps going up but uh, electricity keeps going up but you know there there's 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 some more there's some obvious costs to it seems to me you know they have to uh, generate it they have to transmit it but with what with water and water falls from the sky it collects to the lowest point and then all I have to do is pipe it and if it's that clean I don't understand why they need to be bumping the prices of water which is a natural commodity and and uh, to happen to bump those prices up at a greater percentage than they are electricity, it seems like, and electricity with you know generators and all the costs that go along with that, it just seems to me that we're being built. Uh, you won't get an argument from me about that. Uh, it just we have not seen any sense to this other than just. <laughs> financial mismanagement it comes um, from the word privatize it, it's starting that way and that's yeah. that's been uh, a, a path of, of getting it to that that point and we are very concerned that these bonds are being put out and we'll put out another batch of bonds this year probably close to 100 million and the, who is buying those bonds we don't know because it goes through a central clearinghouse with a co company such as Goldman Sachs and then they sell it to the people who want to buy it and we don't know who has we don't know who's holding the paper and that is a very big concern well it certainly isn't an, uh, you know a hundred or a million people will put a hundred bucks into it you know just just your neighbors that's not who's buying this paper right I mean this no. paper is being bought by uh, people that are on the level of the one percent probably that's exactly right and uh, because when those bonds come out, there's there's a lot of insider Im reaction. People that are they're good customers, they'll get the first grab at those. They, they very rarely go out to the public. 
Grandma Millie does not get these bonds, let me put it that way. Unless Grandma Millie's a millionaire. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, yeah, you know, this we could go on and on about this, and, uh, you know, I don't know, I've heard some rumors a while back about that there's going to be some uh, some folks that are going to be throwing their hat into the uh, mayor's race that, that care about this issue. You know anything about that? I do. <laughs> Earlier this week, and, and I'm not a politician, I'm not a insider or any of that I, uh, but we've we've looked at the candidates that are running for mayor right now and we've given them opportunities uh, to talk about this issue and none of the leaders are doing it none of the other candidates are doing it my point being is that I this this Tuesday I introduced uh, my candidacy for mayor into the um, and <clears throat> made it official because I would like to have at the very least, this discussion throughout the community that needs to take place over the next few months because whoever is the next mayor is going to ha play a large role in these future um, situations with covering the reservoirs and, and treatment. And that's one of the things that I've been dealing with for the last 10 years. Uh, most of that time spent as a member of the Portland Utility Review Board going over the Water Bureau budgets and the Bureau of Environmental Services, which is the sewage and the solid waste, the people that get get the garbage. Uh, I've gone through those budgets and I know where there can be cost-effective measures taken that we can save money and not have to increase this stuff and then move some of that money into addressing the deferred maintenance of our water system that, that needs to happen routinely. Every system needs to be routinely maintained, replacing pipes, replacing valves, doing that type of thing. And that's one of the big issues of, of my campaign will be to promote um, public health and ratepayer benefit, and that's that's where I'm going to be focusing my issue. Well, bringing up making another parallel with electricity. I mean, if electricity doesn't work, you don't get poisoned by it. You know, you, you may lose the electricity, or you may have to pay a lot more for it, or whatever. If the infrastructure isn't built up, but uh, if if the water infrastructure doesn't work right, then the water become, could come, become contaminated. So you said deferred. My ears went up when I, they're deferring this, this infrastructure upkeep? Right, and one of the things that we found out on the Portland Utility Review Board several years ago from an auditor's report was that there's quite a few hours of deferred maintenance that aren't being addressed. And that's one of the things that, that really keeps us uh, involved in, in this issue. Um, replacing pipes that uh, have outlasted their their age that's that's just a function and we know where they are there was a, a piping segment out in park rose a year year and a half ago that was um, defective because it had been old and it was a pipe that had been coated with it's called coal tar and it's that same stuff that they put on roofs that you smell during the summer that's so stinky it's it's a petroleum based uh, tar that they use to line pipes to keep them um, from corroding and those pipes are still in use and those pipes need to be replaced and they're not and the the, the water is toxic because uh, it smells like mothballs from what I understand when the water comes through the sink so that needs to be replaced well it just seems strange to me that you're saying that they're they're putting out bonds I don't understand how all that works they're putting out bonds for uh, hundreds of millions of dollars but they're not using any of that money to to uh, to keep their the uh, the uh, complete water water infrastructure up to snuff. That's right, and we know that there are, are different spots along the the system uh, that need to be taken care of. The open reservoirs need some more routine maintenance. They're they're going to be here, they've been here for a hundred years. They can be here for another hundred years if they're maintained properly. Um, but they haven't been maintained like they should either, because the water bureau is anticipating that they may be gone. They don't need to go. They don't need to go at all, and so we should maintain those and keep them uh, and keep our public health through those open reservoirs. Keep it up to date. Well, if the viewers are alarmed by any of this, you know, good. I hope that you are alarmed about this. And uh, you mentioned that the, well, whatever, Jefferson Smith or any of the folks that are running, I don't mean to single him out as anything worse or better than anybody else, uh, who are running for this are not discussing this. Uh, you also told me in a conversation, or actually in our conversation, that Schumer brought in some kind of, uh, we got a little leeway. So apparently th since, since he brought in this, this law that allows uh, New York and, and other places not to jump on it, and we have a little bit of slack in this, this decision may not be made 
concrete until we have a new mayor and a new uh, couple more members of city council. So it, it would seem to me that uh, the viewers might want to, uh, well, I guess I should phrase it this way. Is there any way that the viewers can, can uh, if, that is, if that is all true, is there any way the viewers can weigh in on this, possibly go to, uh, to the, uh, you know, the debates and bring up these issues or whatever? Well, I think that's a very good point because the debates that I've gone to as an observer, a uh, member of the public and in the audience, uh, none of this has been discussed at all. And that's why I jumped into this, this candidacy because nobody's talking about it and yet it is the th one thing that every one of us has to ne live with and, and we're all, um, you know, dealing with the increases in rates and uh, the cost of living goes up. Uh, this doesn't affect just us and, and the commercial guys. Uh, the, the, the brewers are, are being hurt by it. Um, jobs are being lost by it. We saw over the last few years that companies such as Steinfeld Pickles, they hired a lot of people and, and employed a lot of people and used a lot of water. They've left town and other, other companies have too. So this affects jobs, this affects cost of living, this affects everything that we do and it affects schools because their costs go up, it affects parks because their costs go up, and we're going to see um, more things coming into the property tax um, arena that are not being funded adequately. There's going to be a property tax measure for uh, the libraries, for parks, for schools. There's going to be one that deals with soda pop and one that comes up with uh, arts. So there should be uh, quite a bit of uh, increases of cost of our property taxes over the next year or so. And it's going to be, um, you know, the, the problems with water is gonna, are always going to remain there with our costs. You know, one would think that you're throwing your hat in the ring, you know, somebody from the outside will say, well, you know, he's just a one, a one issue candidate, you know, the, the water. But it, it's obvious to me listening to you talk that you've got a firm grasp of a lot of the dynamics of, 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 of the, that the city council and the mayor has to grapple with. It isn't just water. I mean, that, that you're concerned about. You know, it, 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 maybe it's the fact that just water touches everything. I don't know. Everything touches water. But it seems to me that that one issue uh, puts you in an understanding of uh, so many different dynamics of, of what the, what the city council and the mayor have to deal with. Well, I think you're exactly right, and I appreciate that uh, that comment because the the water system and, and the problems there are, are just illustrative of of the of the problems we have as a city and um, it's the city council that has I, and I want to make it clear and I really need to make this clear tonight that I'm not blaming the Water Bureau itself it's the elected officials that have been um, remiss in, in moving this thing along the way that the, company, the, the public has asked them to the Water Bureau has I've dealt with them for many years they're good honest people who do their job that are just doing what they're told to do and so it's the the decision maker in city council and the rest of the council that have been, um, that have not done their job in, in addressing these issues the way that the community has asked them to. In 2004, we asked them to keep the open reservoirs open through a whole public process. In 2002, the Bull Run Treatment Panel asked them to do the, to go to the EPA and, and fight for us to get a waiver, and none of this has happened. And it's the city council's fault, and. But, but again, the water is just uh, uh, an example, a snapshot of what's going on. The city council, all of us in the community went through this recession. The city council did not feel any pain from the recession. Uh, they just spent money, and that's one of the problems that we see today. Mm -hmm. So that's why I want to be in this, this race to uh, discuss this issue. But in order for you to be in the race, you have to be in the debates. That's and right. uh, how, let's see. I don't know how to phrase this. You've attended some debates, and so who was who was up there uh, being on the debate or or answering questions from the public or whatever? Obviously, Jefferson Smith. Jefferson Smith and Eileen Brady and uh, Charlie Hales have been the ones that have been in the in the public forums. Um, the media and the people putting on those forums have limited to those three for the most part. There have been some exceptions where one of the um, uh, younger uh, candidates has come in and, and spoken, but f overall the, the the discussion has been totally occupied by the three leaders, and that's unfortunate because there are other people that that should be able to speak, and um, 
there's just a lot of information that's not being put out there for the public to understand in this water issue and, and through the other utilities also and actually through all the other bureaus. Uh, each bureau has its own problems and they need to be addressed accordingly. Right, and so you say the media or whoever is uh, is uh, sponsoring these. Well, we're not going to maybe get much of a response from the me from the media if you know, KGW or whoever uh, ha sponsors a debate. But is there any debates being sponsored by like uh, nonprofits like the w League of Women Voters? Um, Perhaps people could put a little pressure on them. Yeah, I think that there may be one of those coming up. But there's one next week from uh, the uh, Lewis and Clark law school that is having one that that did not allow anybody but except the the top three and the northwest examiner newspapers having one next week that did not allow anybody except the the, the leaders and so um, um, that's just the way it is right now hopefully it'll change over the next few months and there'll be a broadening of the uh, participation of the of the candidates because we um, we would like to see that as a community when is this election going to be? Is it May or next November? May 15th, there will be a primary, and then we'll go from there. The top two, whomever they are, will go on to the, uh, to the election in November, and there should be a lot of activity for that election since it's a presidential year, and there will right. be many, yeah. many things on the, on the ballot to, to discuss. So it, in a nutshell, w the city of Portland is at a crossroads, and from a financial standpoint and you're either going to get somebody who's fiscally conservative and and wants to accountability wants accountability for our, our our money and that would be me and uh, others that really are going along and and uh, spending the, uh, agreeing to spend more money that we don't have for projects that we don't need and that's just not the water but for other things that can be done less expensively mm -hmm. Well, I know I appreciate you coming on the program, Scott. I know we talked about only doing a half an hour, but hell, we've eaten up 47 minutes already. So I appreciate your, your expertise in this matter. And let's open up the phones to see if folks want to comment and uh, ask some questions. I know, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've always got questions in, in, in this situation, uh, a lot of questions. It just, it seems to me that... Uh, Aside from the water thing, that is one issue. But another issue is the inaccessibility of our of our electoral system to everyday citizens. And to me, that's as big an issue. And the fact that uh, uh, you're not the only person who's right. coming up from the grassroots. I think there's Rudy Soto, a young man that's been that's ran for uh, issue uh, some kind of uh, might have been city council, it might have been mayor before young Native American man, I know he's been out there, and uh, uh, who was this person that, that a while back was was allowed to come in? Um, Max Broom, I think his name is, and yeah, and he's been out, uh, I think, since last fall. Um, nice guy, uh, and uh, I'm happy he got to participate, but uh, it would be nice to see um, other candidates there also. How many other candidates is it? Are you familiar? There are quite a few. It's a it's a very crowded field. The last thing, the last number I saw was 18 people wow. running for mayor for candidate uh, as candidacy. So that that contributes to why they've limited it to three. I'm sure. Well, I can understand that they would have to do that, but it, it's well. I see we got a phone call, so we'll we'll go to the phone call. Uh, first caller, you're on the air. Hi, I missed part of your earlier discussion, but I. I had big issues with the Water Bureau as well. It seems like there's a gigantic sewer bomb that should be expiring, but I'm not hearing anything about that. I'm hearing about them piling another one on. But my principal issue with the city is the militarization of our police department oh, and the are. way they treat the citizens of this city, and I'd like you to comment on that. All right. I don't know if you're prepared to comment on that. I could do that because I'm really upset about it myself. Well, I think that the police bureau has many issues, and uh, I think it begins with. Um, uh, first of all, let me say I'm happy that they initiated the the drug testing last year, and I think that was a big step forward. Um, there has to be some understanding that the police uh, should not be the first responders to people that are having mental health issues and things like that, and that we need to incorporate first responders that are 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 engaged in, in dealing with people that are having issues at the time. Um, I don't think we need to be putting horses into demonstrations and 
using the pepper spray as much as we do. Absolutely not. Uh, I would like to see from the last, the last week I looked at these, the schematic for the uh, police bureau only having three divisions of precincts, and I have a friend out near the, um, the Gresham border who is served by the St. John's North Portland precinct, and that's, that's way too far for them to respond adequately. So I would like to see the precincts, precincts have a, a more community service type of, uh, community policing type of format where they can respond quickly and, and maybe have less stress on the, on the police people. Uh, but that's an evolving issue and, and whoever takes over is going to have to deal with that and the expense also of the police pension on our property taxes. That keeps going up every year and our property taxes go up with that. And that needs to be addressed also like the auditor has said. All right. Well, hey, thank you for that very level-headed response. It was certainly more level-headed than I would have been. <laughs> good job. I'm trying to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good job. I think we have another call. Next caller. Yes. Hello. Hello. I, I came in a little late, and uh, uh, is this a Portland issue, Metro Portland, or I am from Beaverton, and I wanted to find out if there ah, is good, a, good if point. this also applies to Beaverton, much of what you said. Does Beaverton drink Bull Run water, I guess? <laughs> I they guess do, yeah, yes, they do. Depending on where you live, uh, they do have access to it. One of your sources is also Hag Lake, which is uh, over on the western part of the zone. But, yeah, you could have, uh, depending on where you are, you, you probably do have access to that through uh, Beaverton and the Tualatin Valley Water District. So you're exactly right. You get you're going to be paying for this also, for this problem that doesn't exist in, in this wonderful bull run, water, bull run water. So yeah, and you would be a, you, we, you would be impacted by it. And would we in Beaverton have an opportunity to vote for you as well? Unfortunately not. I would love to take your vote, if, uh, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately not. So you've okay. got your own mayor out there in Beaverton then. All right. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thank, thank you. you. That's a good point because, you know, it isn't just Portland City Limits, obviously. So we have another call. We'll get the next caller on the air. Hello. Hello, you're on the air. Okay, Welcome. Great. Got some more fuel for your fire there, metaphorically speaking, regarding uh, fluoride. I tuned in late tonight and I've been listening intermittently, but there's a book called The Fluoride Deception. has a lot of the proof uh, that uh, basically states how dangerous fluoride is. Um, the fluoride form that they put on our water if they couldn't get rid of it in our water, they would have to pay a hazardous waste site to dump that at <laughs> much greater expense. Exactly. Uh, but there's a couple local cable access shows you'll want to look, watch and listen to. One is the uh, the last two or three months worth of the Tualatin Valley Water District uh, Commissioner meetings. Doctor, uh, he's a local dentist here, Dr. Bill Osmondson, you should have him on your show sometime. Dr. Bill Osmondson had all of his charts and graphs. He's a dentist who believed in fluoride for many years until he started looking at the real uh, proof. And uh, he said it has no, you know, no benefit at all internally and many negative effects. So um, it's just crazy that they're putting this crap in our water. And I haven't seen this completely positively proven for evidence. But a lot of people have said, and maybe you guys, since you have computers and I don't, you can go look it up and find out. But I've heard from a number of reliable sources that old scrambled brains, a.k.a. Adolf Hitler, he put fluoride in the water in Nazi Germany in 1933. And here's something else, a little bit of proof that I have out of a encyclopedia for prescription drugs called the Physician's Desk Reference or the PDR. Right. But I looked up Prozac in there one day. Down at the bottom of Prozac, where they have uh, they have a little area there to put in the chemical symbol, and it actually said fluorohexidine gluconate. So I called up a friend of mine who's a biochemist, and he says, um, "I said the question I asked him. I said, could fluoride be Prozac and Prozac be fluoride?" And he says, "Well, after you describe that chemical symbol, I said it sure. He says it sure sounds like it." So he checked with a guy who has a doctorate in biochemistry. Uh, for another friend of his, and he came, called me back two days later, and he said, yeah, he said, basically it's one and the same thing. Keeping that same thought in mind, fluoride, you can't, you, any of us lay people cannot go and buy fluoride unless we have a prescription from our doctor or dentist. So what my question is, is why are they medicating the masses that they have no right to do it? Now, if, go and watch the Tualatin Valley Water District Commissioner meeting. And I, I think those people have been having a little bit too much fluoridated water because after <laughs> Dr. 
Dr. Bill Osmondson and several other people brought up their charts and graphs and explained everything out and showed them the proof. These uh, brain dead metal muffins, as old Ace would say, uh, Ace Hayes would say, uh, they, they kind of just kind of foo fooed it all off. I mean, it's like, you know, what part of the obvious do you people not get? You know, it's been proven. Dr. Osmondson has charts and graphs, the other people have charts and graphs. And they try and come up with these nonsense excuses saying, well, there's a lot of arguments on the other side. Well, yeah, look at the who funded the arguments on the other side, the chemical companies, you know, big business. Yeah. But, well, I uh, appreciate anyway, that uh, input. That out. Uh, oh, also, Dr. Bill Osmondson and several other people that were against fluoride were also in the uh, January 23rd episode of the City of Forest Grove uh, City Council meeting. Now, the... Oh, are we going to have to cut you off, man? We're running out of time here. We're running out of time. We're down to about a little over two minutes. You gave us plenty to chew on there. That was an incredible amount of information. I think that floor, uh, fluoride deception, there was a video about that. We actually had a fellow on our show many years ago, I forget his name now, who talked about this. And uh, I, maybe we should do that again if, if there's that much interest in it and there's people out there that have that much good information that we had to just cut him off because it was just running out of time. So we're down to about two minutes. And uh, we've already talked about fluoridization and maybe we don't need to go into that any further for at the time being. We should continue on. Uh, you're running for, you're throwing your hat in the ring and uh, you know, people need you to jump behind them more now than you'd need their vote later in order to get some kind of equal playing ground, uh, voting ground or whatever, for people to, to find out how, what some of these issues are, it seems like to me. Well, I agree, and I think that with my science background, we're going to be facing not only water, but there's a whole thing coming up now that was just in the paper earlier this week with the um, Willamette Harbor Superfund and the contamination there and how science is going to address that and I have some ideas about that that I'll talk about as in the weeks and months ahead. Um, some solutions to that that they're not exploring right now that are very cost effective. Mm -hmm. We're down to about a minute here. I want to thank the crew. Uh, they've done a great job uh, getting these yeah. phone calls out to us. I want to thank the phone calls. I apologize again to that last caller, but we needed a couple of minutes to, to wrap up the show and uh, to just to kind of, you know, cinch up the things that we talked about during this program, uh, fluoride being one of them, and apparently it's, it's a little more alive out there with the people than I thought. But uh, any sound bites for the last 20 seconds or so there? Well, I will be, um, my website, scottfernandezformayor.com, www.scottfernandezformayor.com, is up and running now, and as and you can read my positions on uh, some of the major things we've talked about tonight, and my comment to the Oregon Health Authority on how we need to repeal the regulation of this LT2, and also I'll be having position papers posted as time goes on in the next weeks and months that you'll see in more detail what I'm saying and thinking and what my positions are so you can see exactly where I am. All right, that gives us about 10 seconds. Uh, thanks again for the calls. Sorry again for that fellow we cut off. And uh, thank you for the crew and we'll be back next week.